my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God.
of trials and tribulations, you're God. Regardless of our circumstances, you remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we come today believing and trusting what your word says. Your love endures forever, God. And so we come today and say, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are peace to our soul. So Lord, we come today ready to worship you, ready to thank you, ready to give you our lives, holy surrender to our God today. So Lord, we thank you, God, and we pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, welcome, 1030 service. You excited today? Awesome. At this time, we're going to dismiss our student life ministry. If you can go and have a seat real quick, I'm going to introduce you to Tim and Brianice Mallory to come on up here, our missionaries to Colombia. Let's give them a hand. All right, South Bay, you can do a little bit better than that. Let's let them know their love. Awesome. As I mentioned, Tim and Brianese are missionaries in Colombia. And so uh, we always want you to get to know them. They'll be outside in the foyer after service. But hola. Hello. Buenos <laughs> dias. That's the extent of my Espanol. But uh, hey, guys. So how did you guys end up in Colombia? Well, um, she was born there. <laughs> so she was born there. But I ended up going down there in 2013. Uh, as a missionary, went down, I was a student at Patmos, so I was uh, in, in 2012, went on a mission trip there, and after that, it wasn't, a lot of people go on mission trips, and then when they're on the trip is when, you know, they're feeling something, the Lord's stirring in them, I got to come back. That wasn't my case, but when I got back after the, that trip, the Lord started just stirring in something in me mm -hmm. to go for Columbia, and uh, confirmed it through his word, through, you know, different people, leaders in, in our life. And uh, Pastor Chet was very much involved in that as well as uh, Pastor Zach. And they were part of sending, sending me out. And so when I went down there first, I went to Barranquilla, Colombia. I was thinking I'd be there six months, maybe nine. And then from uh, 10 and a half years later, still there. So I, went, so I moved. From, that's a long time. Yeah, yeah. So I was in Barranquilla for six months. Then I moved to Cartena. And that's been in a few other places, but that's been kind of the home base for me over this past decade in the field. So, yeah. That's awesome. And so you got to meet your wife there? Yes, met my <laughs> lovely wife. She is from Cartagena, right? Do you want to say anything? Or, you want to say hello? 
Uh, so she's uh, she's uh, from there. We met. She started working at the church with us there, kind of administrative assistant in the office. And I was like, oh, hey. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. Not, uh, Is that how it works as a missionary? That's exactly oh, how hey, it works. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I so yeah, that. if you're looking. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, so we've been married now almost five years. Awesome. Give it up. So with all that time on the mission field, so what do you, what's going on now? What's going on now in your life? Yeah, it, it, we were just talking. It, it's always something, you know, the Lord never lets us get comfortable. So we've had, I've been, uh, done a lot, been a part of a lot of different cool things that the Lord's done with us in the field of the church that, uh, you know, as part of helping plant a church in the, uh, Santiago, who was the church planner who went down there at the same time I did, you know, this year he um, said, okay, the church is planted. So I'm, I'm going to go back to Florida. And so that, uh, and the Lord, you know, as, as seems like the Lord's calling me to step into that uh, lead pastor role. So I'll be stepping into that, and we're in the middle of the transition. So uh, first Sunday of February, they'll be praying me in as the, the lead pastor of Calvary Cartagena. So. Amen. Cool. So y'all, we need to be praying for Pastor Tim and Brian Nice as they step into this role. So with that in mind, you, you heard about missions, you've gone on missions, so your belief how did that affect the way you behave? How, how, what, how did you get to where you were? What happened in your heart and your mind to draw you to the mission field? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty simple. It's the, for me, it's, you, know, you look at the Great Commission, and it's the Great Commission. It's not the Great Suggestion. When Jesus said to go, right. you know, it's, it's, it, that's for, and that's not just, some people think that was just for the 12 or for the, you know, the apostles and the early church, but no, that's for every single one of us as believers. God's called us all to go. And so, it, you know, for everyone, it looks different. Not everyone's got the call in to go to another country or another continent, you know, I think, or, or to live there. But, I mean, everyone's called to go, whether it's on a short-term trip whether it's, you know, uh, just being involved in supporting and praying for missionaries or whether it's, you know, going to a, a different part of L.A. We were, you know, we've been in L.A. this weekend. There's a lot of places where you can go, uh, you know, out of your comfort zone and just go and share the word. So I think it's just understanding and believing that that's not a suggestion. That's the commission. That's the word of the Lord, and it's to be obeyed. Awesome. So with that in mind, church, we know how this rolls. We're, we're sending them back to continue the ministry. So we're gonna go ahead and pray for Pastor Tim and Brianese. But if you wanna stretch out your hand as we lay hands on them, knowing and believing God has a perfect plan for their life. Let's pray. Father, we come today and we believe in your word. And your word is what moves us and shapes us and changes us and inspires us to do what you've called us. As Pastor Tim shared, Lord, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. It's what you said to do. So God, help him and Brianice and their whole family to be biblical and to be spiritual. God, I pray all these years of serving, all these years of going, God, as he steps into the role as a senior pastor, God, that you would take all this training, you would take all the conversations, you take every part of it to make him the senior pastor that Cabby Chapel Cartagena needs. So God, you know uh, the challenges. And God, though there be many, thank you, Lord, you've already gone ahead of them. So I pray for him specifically as he teaches in Espanol, as he ministers, as he loves on people, God, that Brianice would step into that role also as a pastor's wife, as she ministers to the ladies, God, that you would give her words from heaven, God, that's what we want. We don't want our words. Our words are weak. Our words uh, don't affect much, but your word does the trick, does the thing in our lives, God, that causes us to live for you. So thank you for this couple. Thank you for all that you've done and what you're going to continue to do. We love you. We thank you, God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Tim. beginning one with God the Lord most high hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are 
1030. Happy New You. Get it? Last week's message. New You, New Year. Uh, okay. Great. Titus chapter 2, as we get back into Titus, 1 Timothy chapter 4, as well as Matthew's gospel chapter 7. Three areas of scripture. If you need a Bible, there is one in the seat back pocket there in front of you. 
Titus 2, 1 Timothy 4, Matthew chapter 7. As you're turning in scripture, would you please welcome to the stage Michelle, who's getting ready to go to Peru as a missionary. 10.30, you can do, I know you're turning your Bibles. But if you're coming to our Thursday nights, we're talking about the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Michelle is in that chapter. I plan on pointing her out somewhere along the line. Hey, Michelle, we are so thankful that you're here. Um, What's going on? You um, are heading over to Peru. I am, yes. I'm headed to uh, Calvary Chapel. I'm not sure if we're on here. There we go. All right. There we go. You can hear me, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm headed to Cajabamba, Peru to join the Alegres over there. Amen. Uh, now, you guys yeah. know the Alegres. They were here in September. We did a global outreach project to finish their building um, to be able to receive abused, abandoned, and neglected children this Christmas. And that was our global outreach. So, everyone, they're listening. So, everyone say, hey, Juan and Sandra. There we go. All right, great. Great to see you guys. And Michelle is on her way over there. Now, how did this happen? Yeah, I was not expecting it at all. Actually, back in January last year, uh, now last year, um, I felt the Lord telling me that a change was coming. I worked at Coast Hills Church with you before, and um, I was working there and just felt like the Lord was telling me that a change was coming had no idea what that meant, decided that I was just going to be present and give it my all until the Lord opens a door. And then we ended up taking our youth to Cajabamba, Peru, to help with the Refuge of Hope and, and Calvary Chapel, Cajabamba. And while we were there, the Lord was just challenging my heart specifically um, with different, like, cost of discipleship type verses, you know? And And it was just challenging me so much. Like, would I really give up all that I have and and renounce all that I have and follow him wherever he leads? And and then after the trip, he just continued to lay on Acts 1-8 and all of those, uh, Romans 10, just all of those verses on missions that were just hitting me so deeply. I knew the Lord was calling me to missions, and then it just became praying about where. And I felt like he confirmed going back to Peru, so... It's been such a gift. Michelle was a student of mine at Patmos, and then she came on staff with us at Coast Hills Church. Um, We left her there at Coast Hills, even though we wanted her to come here, but it was the best thing for Coast Hills. And um, now God is calling you out, which is so exciting. Um, Now, you really believe, you really believe that God has called us to go on mission. How has that affected your behavior? Yeah, I think... um I feel like it's not hard to believe that called us that God has called us on mission because it's just so um, it's so straightforward in Scripture uh, that Jesus' words to his disciples were were go and make disciples and so um, that I think belief of the fact that I'm called to obey God in every area of my life and and every command um, to go and make them obey all of His commands um, it's been. That belief, I think, has affected every area of my life, and I hope continues to affect every area of my life, whether that's going um, abroad or going to my next-door neighbor. Uh, So I think, for me, the thing that hit me the most on this trip, uh, this last trip, was just the fact that not only are we called to go, um, but also God himself, like, we will stand before him and he will ask us what we did with the things that we were given. Amen. And that God has given me so much so that I have so much to give. Amen. And I think for, for me, that belief, knowing I'm going to stand before God and what I want to hear is well done, good and faithful servant, uh, has prompted me to go. Amen. Church, um, we are sending one of our best. And you have an opportunity to meet Pastor Tim uh, and his wife, Rennie's, and you also have the opportunity to meet Michelle out in the lobby. Would you just be Calvary Chapel South Bay family and love on these people that are serving the Lord around the world? And what we want to do now is pray for Michelle and pray for our Bible study. Father, I'm just so thankful for Michelle, and I'm so grateful for what you're doing in her life. Lord, she has always been dear to Andre and I's heart because she's dear to your heart. And she has followed you faithfully through thick and thin. And so, Lord, I pray the power of your Holy Spirit upon her 
And I ask you, Jesus, to move in a way, Lord, that all of Peru will be changed out of Cajabamba because of her ministry. I believe, Lord, that you are doing a great and supernatural work there, and I believe in sending Michelle. Lord, there is going to be even a greater work. So, Father, we know wherever two or more are gathered, there you are. So while we pray for the Alegres and all that God is doing, we're thankful that Michelle as well is joining them. And we ask God, let your power fall on that place. Lord Jesus, we pray now for our study. Give us the understanding so that we might be able to be obedient, just like Michelle sets an example for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the old men be. Stop there if you would. Are you aware that what you believe will affect your behavior? Michelle believes that God said go. So she, her behavior is affected with what she believes. Oh, let me make it, break it down. Do you remember when you were younger and there was a monster in the closet? You believed it. And your behavior was that any noise that you heard, you yelled, Mom, leave the light on. Oh, you believed it. Many of you, when I was younger, I believed after watching Jaws that there was a shark in my pool and it was going to eat me anytime I chose to swam alone. So I never swam alone in my pool because I did not want Jaws to come up from the drain and eat me. Some of you believe that fast food is not good for you. Shame on you. <laughs> You're saving a lot more money than the rest of us. Some people believe that everyone likes them, so they have a lot of friends. Some people believe that no one likes them, so they live as hermits. The truth is our belief affects our behavior. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, as a man thinks, so he is. I'm always amazed when I go to the mall, and people come the way they come dressed to the mall, and I I think to myself, you looked in the mirror and went, "Mm, I look good. You believed it. So you walked out looking like that. I give them credit for the confidence that they have. Some of you are like, have you looked at yourself? Well, I believe something about this, and I chose to behave in it. But what you believe affects the way you behave. And sometimes, sometimes, your behavior can enlighten you to what you actually believe. You think you believe something, but your behavior dictates something else. For example, let me use a positive one. You believe in coming to church. And so this morning, you got up and you behaved in your belief because you believe what the Bible says that we're to gather together. You got up out of your bed and you responded with your behavior and here you are at church. I got good news for you. You did it. You get the going to church spiritual badge today. So if you are struggling in other areas of disobedience in your life, today at least you obeyed and you came to church. You believed it, and your behavior was affected. Now, what we believe, what we believe is called doctrine. Doctrine. And how we behave develops our character. Now, our doctrine defines our character, and our character should be defined by our doctrine. So this word doctrine is very important. But we need to be careful. We need to be careful of thinking that doctrine is a scary word that only theologians discuss and talk about. See, I blame theologians for that. Let me give you an example. Soteriology. Some of you thought I just spoke in tongues. Well, let me interpret for you. It's the study of salvation. 
But theologians, they just put a big word to it, soteriology, okay? Listen to this one, harmartiology. You won't find them at the zoo. A harmartiologist you will not find at the zoo. You see, the harmartiologist is someone that studies the nature of sin. I don't know if you knew that. (laughs) I did, I'm a theologian. (laughs) Or maybe ecclesiology. (laughs) Gesundheit. Well, no, 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 that's just a Greek word that's turned into an English word that's supposed to be the study of the church. And what theologians have done is they've come up with these smart-sounding terms when we're exhorted in Scripture to keep things simple. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, take a look. Paul says, my boasting is this, our boasting is this. The testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity. And godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. So what theologians have done is come up with these big terms and we're all afraid of doctrine. So when we hear apologetics, uh, do Christians say sorry all the time? Like we go around, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I apologize, I apologize. What's apologetics? No, apologetics is just another big Greek term for the study on how to defend your faith. Let me give you another one. Oh, the hypostatic union. Oh, take that one to the theological bank. When you, when you go out on Monday, just tell people you learned about the hypostatic union at church. No, don't tell them that. But the hypostatic union is just a theological term for Jesus as the unique God-man. But what theologians have done is made us afraid of doctrine, caused us to steer away from doctrine by these big terms and have made doctrine something that it's not. Instead, doctrine shouldn't be scary. It should actually be refreshing. It should be sweet. Listen to what God says about learning his word. Let my teaching, this is God speaking, drop as rain. My speech, now he's speaking to people that are living in a desert, okay? So my speech distill as the dew, as rain drops on the tender herb and as showers on the grass. Jesus says, listen, when you, God says, when you get my word, it should drop as rain. It should be delivered as refreshing. Listen, I, I, listen if you watched uh, Christian television, Turn off some of those televangelists. Turn off the sound. Just turn down the sound and just watch their actions. Just watch them. Is it refreshing? Because God's word should be refreshing. Listen to what else God says about his word. He says this in Psalm 19. More to be desired, his word is more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than Kit Kats and the, excuse me, honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Doctrine should be refreshing to us. It should be sweet to us. In fact, the Holy Spirit commits us and commends us that we should dig into doctrine. Turn with me, keep your finger in Titus. Turn with me just a few pages to the left over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Take a look at what the Holy Spirit encourages us. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. The Holy Spirit speaking to us. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Timothy was struggling in his behavior. He wasn't operating in his gift. So Paul tells him, commit to doctrine. Look at verse 15. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Let everyone see your growing. Now verse 16. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Paul thought the perfect prescription for Timothy's wrong behavior was dig into doctrine. You need to know your Bible. 
That was his remedy for discovering what to believe would affect Timothy's behavior. In fact, our Christian doctrine should define our behavior and make our character. And if there are characters in our life that are not defined by our doctrine, what we believe, we probably need to evaluate what we actually believe. Because our belief affects our behavior. Go back with me to Titus, just a few pages back over to the right. Let's take a look at this. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Paul was very concerned about the church knowing doctrine. He wanted them to know what they believe. And he says to Titus, it needs to be sound doctrine. Now that word sound, it's the word healthy. In other words, what we're learning should produce in us spiritual life because the words of Jesus are spirit and they are life. So that means doctrine has got to come from his word, not Oprah. Did you just mention Oprah in church? I just read an article, and she just communicated something, and I read everything. I never knew this, Oprah. Oh, my goodness, now that I know, I'm going to start behaving this way. But it wasn't biblical. You see, healthy doctrine comes from the Word, not from your influencer on TikTok. It's amazing to me. Because that TikTok influencer is wearing those clothes, you will go to the mall and buy it thinking you look like them when you walk out the store. It's not true. You don't look like them. They haven't eaten in 30 days. That's why they look like that. (laughs) But there are influencers. Now, maybe yours is not Oprah. Maybe yours is not TikTok. I'm not sure who you're listening to, but the Bible is the only thing that gives us healthy doctrine so we know what to believe in order to know how to behave. Look at Romans chapter 15, verse 4. The Bible says this, For whatever things were written, speaking about your Bible, before were written for our doctrine, written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. The Bible is beckoning us to let it be your influencer. Because if the Bible is your influencer, it will conform you into the character of Christ. And what we believe will affect how we behave. Listen, it's 1 Timothy chapter 6. Would you take a look? If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words or things that go along with the word of God, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. There's where our belief affects our behavior. Godliness is a behavior. He's proud, knows nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, and evil suspicions. And what he's saying is, when you got bad doctrine, you're going to have bad behavior. And at this point in the church, Sound doctrine was already established. The words of Jesus were already ringing true, and in the first century, they believed that Jesus is the Christ. They believed that Jesus was risen from the dead. They believed that salvation was by faith through Jesus Christ alone. And for 2,000 years, because of their commitment to doctrine, we still believe that today. Now, just imagine if they didn't fight for doctrine back then, and then in 600 AD, Muhammad comes along and begins to pervert the Christian faith. Just think, if they didn't hold the fact that Jesus is the Son of God when the Jehovah's Witness came along, that we would be perverted in faith. Just think, if they didn't hold to the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the grave and the Mormons came along. Oh, Pastor Chet, you're hitting everybody this week. (laughs) 
2,000 years later, Calvary Chapel South Bay exists because we hold to the doctrine that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's a truth of Scripture. But Jesus made something very clear, that the enemy would plant weeds in the wheat. And his goal is to deceive the elect. It's Matthew chapter 24. Take a look, verse 24. For false Christ and false prophets, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, Christian science, will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Do you know what Paul called this? Paul called this the doctrine of demons. It's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He makes a very clear warning. Watch out in the last days for the doctrine of demons. And let me tell you why he called it the doctrine of demons. is because the power of hell is behind it. And we've seen this throughout church history. It's not just in our culture. No, back in the 3rd century, there was a heresy called the Arian heresy. And it believed... And it spread through the world like wildfire fire that Jesus Christ was not the divine, not the Son of God. He was a created being. So concerning, Constantine called church leaders together in Nicaea. And in 325 AD, the church got together and they made the doctrine that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And because of that doctrine, Calvary Chapel South Bay exists. They stood for doctrine. It's not just third century. Here in our 21st century, we have a new doctrine called modernism. This is the belief that all doctrines are subject to change and that they ought to change depending on the time, the culture, and the location. The Bible is just adaptable. You see, someone, false teacher in the church, thought that the church needed to be culturally correct instead of the church correcting the culture. And that teaching is permeated within the church today. This is the reason that Paul is telling Titus, teach sound, teach healthy doctrine. Because even in this church, people were teaching unhealthy doctrine from the very beginning of the first church in Titus chapter 2. Look at Titus 1 verse 10. Look Look at them. For there are many insubordinate. Look at their behavior already. Both idle talkers, in other words, they have no idea what they're talking about, and deceivers. They're saying things that are not true, especially of the circumcision. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Can you imagine if the doctrine of the circumcision won in the church? And you got saved, and the next thing you know, clip, clip? Come on. Thank God that doctrine didn't survive in the church. They were insubordinate. They were lying to the church. Look at their behavior. Look at what heaven thinks about them in verse 16. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. In other words, their character and their behavior look nothing like God. Look at heaven's perspective. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. You see, at the time of the first century, there was a false doctrine, not only the circumcision. Oh, there was Gnosticism. It exists today. See, Gnosticism, they didn't want to forsake the lewd and lascivious culture. They wanted to, you know, they wanted to watch the rated R movies and they wanted the world to decide what they can watch or not. I mean, when the world says it's okay for if you're over 17, then it must be okay. I mean, PG-13, the world is determined, right, that your 13-year-old can watch this now. So because it's PG-13, it must be safe because the world told us that it's safe. Just going to let that one sit for just a minute. I'm not, I just went to a movie last night. I'm not, great movie, migration, nice little family movie, okay, PG. Now listen, I'm not saying anything negative about movies. What I'm trying to communicate, we've got to be careful what we believe. If we believe that the world can tell us what our standard is, then that's a false belief. 
We've got, that will then affect our behavior and we'll think that we're allowed to do something simply because the world told us that we're allowed to do it. That's what the Gnostics did. Their world was so lewd and so lascivious. You see, they developed a doctrine. They developed a belief system. They developed, your flesh is evil, your spirit is good. And because your flesh is evil and you live in the world, which is evil, enjoy the world. Let your flesh, let it rip. Whatever you want to do, you want to get drunk, you want to do this, you want to do that, you just go for it. Let the flesh enjoy because your spirit's good. And when you die, because you know, there's the Gnosticism, because you know about salvation, because you come to church and you sit in church. Now, you live any way you want, but you sit in church. And because you sit in church and because you know truth, then you can go to heaven. It's a false truth. You can't live any way you want and say that you're saved. Jesus calls this vanity, useless. It's Matthew, Mark chapter 7, verse 7. Listen, and in vain, useless, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He points this out, that only God provides for us what we should believe. It's John chapter 7. Take a look at the screen, verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but is his who sent me. Mine comes directly from God. If anyone wills to do his will, so if you have some behavior that looks like godliness, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it's from God or whether I speak by my own authority. What Jesus is saying is, if you believe what I'm telling you, your behavior will be affected by it. I proved it. You came to church because you believe that we need to gather together. So then what Paul says is, anything other than that? The perspective of heaven is, it's abominable. It's disobedience. It's disqualifying. Because your belief affects your behavior. And Jesus warned us, don't get information from false teachers. It's Matthew chapter 7. Would you go there with me? Matthew's gospel, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, take a look at verse 15. We're at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has just given the truths on the way that a Christian should behave in this world. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he knows that false teachers are going to come in and try to corrupt the character of the church. So he warns the church, and he says this, Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they want to eat you alive. The ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn brushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. What Jesus is doing, he's not just giving us a warning. He's telling us how we'll know who they are. Because there are going to be people that will try to come and corrupt the character of the church. And this is a big deal. Because Jesus told us to be peaceful to go the second mile, to keep our promises and love our enemy because when we act like that in the world, it leads people to Christ. But when false teachers come in and they're mean and they're hateful and they're contentious and divisive, that leads people away from Christ. And the job of the church is to go into the world with the character of the Sermon on the Mount so that we can bring people to Christ. So he warns us, don't gather anything from them. Don't learn from them. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. And all you have to do is just watch their behavior to see what they believe. A good tree will bear good fruit. They'll follow all of Scripture. But a bad tree will produce bad fruit. 
They'll just pick and choose little verses here and there so that they can qualify their own personal lifestyle. So this also applies to us personally. Stop just for a minute. Because I know you're probably thinking of this person and that person. Could you just stop and think about yourself for just a minute? When you see bad fruit in your life, the only thing that you can do is cut the tree down. That's what Jesus said. You got to get rid of it. You got to rid and you got to burn it. You see, we got to realize that you must be believing something that's not true. So the enemy lied to you. And you've been living your life on a lie instead of the truth if it's bad fruit. So you've got to replace that lie with truth because truth will set you free. And what we believe is how we will behave. But Jesus also warned us of something else, and this is very important. Because sometimes a bud will grow in our life and we'll think, ah, it's okay, it's just a little bit of a little bud. It won't grow into a tree. Just give it five years. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16. He said this, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, unfortunately, the disciples thought he was talking about bread. Finally, they realized at the end of the chapter, and they said, then, the disciples, they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Let me tell you why. In Galatians chapter 5, the Bible tells us that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Do you remember when you first got married? Roses are red. Violets are blue. I can't wait to be loving all over you. I just made it up. Do you remember when you used to bring roses, write letters? Do you remember when you used to get butterflies every time he called? Now, 30 years later, where's my socks? Where's dinner? Are you home late again? What happened? A little leaven. And 30 years later, it kneaded through the whole lump. And now your whole marriage is affected because you let a bud of bad fruit grow. So Jesus says, when you see the bud, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Now go back with me to Titus chapter 2. Because what you believe is going to affect your behavior. And just a little bad doctrine will eventually impact our whole character. Take a look. I'm going to prove it to you. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience, that the older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to be, and there's the implied word, loving to their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to Be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bondservants to be obedient to their masters. You get the point? Our belief affects our behavior. And he says, but as for you, because there's a clear contrast between pretenders and authentic Christians. This word but is very important. Because he's talking about people that are in the church that they say they know God. 
but they're abominable as far as heaven is concerned. They're pretenders. They profess to know God in their work, to know God, but in their works, in their character, in their behavior, they deny Him. Then there's authentic Christians. He says, teach sound doctrine. You see, these are the learners. They want to know the Scripture. Authentic Christians not only want to know, but then they become something. They put the Word of God into practice. There's a character that begins to form in them that looks more and more like Jesus. This makes absolute sense to me. Because if I want to be a doctor, first I get my four-year biology... Biology. (laughs) My four-year biological degree. Then I go to medical school and I spend eight years learning so I can be a doctor. Well, if I want to be a Christian, I come to church to learn and study the Bible. It just makes sense to me. And an authentic Christian allows doctrine, doctrine is what we're learning, to begin defining their character. So when you're here today, oh, wait, I didn't know that the Bible says we need to gather together. I did it. I was obedient. Oh, that's a tree that you need to fertilize. That's a tree that you need to water and make sure that it grows. But some of us got some bad trees. Things that are like bad behavior. Look back up if you would. There's a reason in verse 2 that he's commending the older men to be sober. Being sober is a good tree. But what it implies is cut down your addictions. You've got to throw that tree out. Anything that demands that you pay attention to it. He says, you got to be sober. He says, let me tell you another good tree. Be reverent. But that means you got to cut down the dishonoring, disrespectful tree. And that means maybe honoring your employer. That means maybe choosing to respect your parents. That means not cheating on your taxes. That means giving your employer everything you've got. Choosing to be reverent is a good tree. Getting rid of disrespectful things is, a, is what you're supposed to do because it's a bad tree. And then he says this, be temperate. Oh, what a great tree, a temperate tree. So what it implies is you've got to cut down the tree of moodiness. You've got to get rid of that tree. You've got to be temperate and sober-minded. He says, be sound in faith. What he's encouraging us is, know the word of God. And then he says, oh, let me tell you another tree, the loving tree. Oh, that tree is great. Everyone can feel and come and take some fruit from it. But let me tell you what tree he's telling you to cut down, the hateful tree, the unforgiving, resentful, mad, angry tree at the entire world. He says, cut that tree down. And then he says, The patient tree. This word is the word perseverance. He says, you got to nurture patience in your life, but you got to cut down the urge to quit because Christians don't draw back. It's Hebrews chapter 5. We don't give up. We persevere because Jesus Christ is with us and we have the holy power of the Holy Spirit to back us up. Church. Just that one little list. How many of us have got some trees that we need to cut down? But I want you to see something else here before we close. He says, teach the older men. Teach the older women. Teach the younger women. Teach the younger men. Do you know what that means? Here's what I believe because of what the Word says. That the Bible has got something for every age group in the world. Church is not for your grandmother. It's for you. 
Church is not for just old people. It's for everyone. The Bible offers every age group age-appropriate material to build your character to look more like Christ. Teach them all, he says. But I want you to know something else. Not only does it speak to every age group, it speaks to every situation. He says, teach the older men that they be. Teach the older women that they be. By the way, Pastor Chet, when are you giving it to the women? Um, husbands, stop calling the church. We have husbands calling the church asking when I'm going to give it to their wives. We don't give it to anybody. We lovingly express the word of God. Don't call the church. This week, someone called and said, I brought my wife every week since Pastor Chet said he was going to do that. When is he going to give it to her? Okay, you're the problem, not your wife. Only the ladies clapped. <laughs> and you're up next week, by the way. You're up next week. All the ladies say amen. amen. <laughs> you all say that next week. Did you read your list? Oh, my goodness. See, not only does the Bible speak to every age group, it speaks to every situation in your life. Just because you don't know what the Bible has to say about what you're going through doesn't mean he doesn't speak to it. It's 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has given to us all things, not some, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So as more you learn the doctrine of Jesus who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. we got to look at doctrine as great and precious promises. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Your behavior changes, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When you understand good doctrine, your life will exhibit good behavior. And the Bible answers all questions pertaining to your spiritual life. So if you don't know if you should leave, if you should live in Texas or be in California, just ask him. He'll send you a text message and tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you don't know what your major is in college, just ask him. He'll text you. He will show you, he loves to guide you. And I believe that he'll guide you because he told me that he would. And if you don't know how to behave in a situation, just ask him. He'll send you a text message. He will speak to you because what you believe affects the way you behave. And can I tell you something about your behavior? It's important to God. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, in speaking of Jesus, listen to his testimony. And he grew in wisdom and stature with both God and man. The way you behave is important to God. Father, I come before you in Jesus' name. And I am so thankful for the body here at Calvary Chapel, South Bay. Because they believe they came to church. And so now I ask God that your spirit would move in this place. How many of you got some trees you need to cut down? Go ahead and raise your hand. Just humbly, just lift up your hand. I got some trees that need to come down. Keep your hands up as I pray for you, Lord Jesus. Truth of the matter is, we probably all got some weeds amongst our wheat. And so, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus with those that have humbly lifted up their hands, would you bring an axe? to those trees. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name.
Hey, church. By the way, if you got daughters, this verse is great. Told all of their boyfriends, if this relationship produces good fruit, I'll nourish the tree. But I got an ax in case it produces bad fruit. Amen? Would you stand with me? Here at Calvary Chapel South Bay, we memorize scripture. Our scripture memory verse is Matthew 7, 17. Would you say it with me? Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. So if you got bad behavior, know that a bad belief is connected to it. You gotta find what that is and replace it with truth. Our challenge to change this week. Take note of your behavior this week. You may discover what you actually believe. Amen? Let's worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll see you later. Have a great morning.